wonderful good morning and a warm welcome, of course, to our fifth webinar of our GTCC Clean Air Initiative series, Green Solutions from Germany. As I can see, many of you seem to be back in the office already, but some are still working from home. And this brings us actually right to our today's topic, because Asia's deadliest health public crisis isn't COVID, it's air pollution. And as governments fail to curb the world's worst air, and this may now sound a little dramatic, but it's true, literally millions of people are dying avoidable death. In Southeast Asia, the Gulf of Thailand is particularly impacted by climate change and air pollution. And I guess this may have prompted Prime Minister Prayut to declare climate change a matter of life and death at last World Climate Conference in Glasgow. But unfortunately, as we know, little is done in Thailand to improve the country's air quality. Environmental politics and awareness are not necessarily a top priority among the country's leaders and its people. And many of you know, in Thailand, we've been living with air pollution and the dreadful PM 2.5 for many years. And we've been wearing masks you know, for many years before actually COVID-19 arrived. In 2016 already, the, the World Bank reported that 50,000 Thais died from air pollution-induced diseases, while the effects of air pollution on the national health budget it eats more than 6% of Thailand's annual GDP. That's a lot of money. And just recently, due to the increasing negative impact of air pollution on the public health, the World Health Organization has reduced the guideline for annual average exposure to PM 2.5 from 10 to 5 micrograms per cubic meter. The threshold in Thailand is 50. But unfortunately, less than 8% of the world's population actually can enjoy such clean air. And nowhere air pollution has a larger impact than in Asia. Of the world's cities with the worst air pollution last year, and you all know the Swiss air quality technology company IQ Air, they ranked the top 148 cities in the world with the worst air, are all located in the Asia Pacific region. But there's hope. And today, it's my great pleasure to welcome our today's guest speaker, Mr. Björn Gustrau. He's the Vice President and Marketing and Sales Manager for Thailand and Vietnam at Mercedes-Benz in Thailand. Good morning, Björn. Good morning. Just... Mercedes-Benz is another German leader in green innovation, and Björn will speak about Mercedes-Benz contrib contribution as a local and global spearhead of the automotive sector to improve air quality. So we will hear about the Mercedes-Benz initiative, Charge to Change, and how public awareness can be raised on the need of prevention of air pollution. So Björn, that's all from my side. The floor is yours, and we are looking forward to your presentation. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andreas. Yeah, good morning also from my side. Very well, uh, warm welcome, and I'm really looking forward to um, to this presentation today and also to hopefully a lively discussion um, after the presentation. So is a Mercedes-Benz initiative and contribution um, as a sparehead actually uh, on clean air initiatives globally and locally in Thailand. So first of all, um, and in the beginning of my presentation, I would like to go to Mercedes-Benz AG's global initiatives. And after that, we will go to what we are doing in Thailand. And later on, I hope we will have a lively discussion um, on what we, are going, um, what we are going to do in Thailand together, how we can create a movement, because that's all about I want to talk today. So our global ambition is clearly to get carbon neutrality by 2039. And um, this is really important for Mercedes-Benz. And that is uh, why we have to go all electric within this decade. So um, what we are striving for is for 50% plug-in hybrids and BEV share and offer an all electric alternative for every model we make but that obviously depends always on the national 
situation, meaning if there is no infrastructure, and we will talk later about it, uh, we cannot uh, make this offer. So it is important that together and mutually um, we foster um, these initiatives and we bring also the infrastructure to, uh, to a new level in most uh, countries still to, uh, to be approached. So our global electric portfolio, as you can see, is already um, quite uh, huge and it's increasing basically, I would say almost every day, uh, but it's strongly increasing. So we already this year introduced the EQA, the EQB, the EQS and the EQE. And next year we will introduce SUV versions of the EQS uh, and the EQE. Now, this is still, as I said, globally speaking. What we are doing then on a local level, I will further uh, demonstrate later. Our electrifying strategy also for Mercedes-Benz does not stop with our um, normal product lineup. It also, uh, just, it also includes all our iconic models. Um, for example, the Maybach SUV or the G-Class um, SUV and all AMG models. So we are pretty serious about what we are doing and all these vehicles will be uh, full electric in future. And if you had the chance to read about um, the IAA in Munich this year and what the press, uh, the world press, I would say, was writing about our G-Class full electric, which we presented there, um, it, was, um, it was astonishing. And we are looking very forward also to have this iconic vehicles electrified and contributing to a good future. So all new architectures from us will be on an electric base from 2025 onwards. And that is a considerable achievement from our side. And it shows that we are really serious about what we are want to do. Now, this is the global perspective, as I said before. Where are we in Thailand? And in Thailand, as you can see, we already introduced the plug-in hybrid in 2015. That was the blue tech, the blue tech hybrid, sorry. Then in 2016, we went with a plug-in hybrid first generation. 2017, plug-in hybrid second generation. 2018, we already presented the concept EQA and we started with charging stations in Thailand. In 2019, we came with our third generation of plug-in hybrids, and we were the first one who introduced a local battery production, a big step within Thailand. And in 2020, last year, basically, we started with charge to change. I will, further, I will later explain what charge to change is all about. But this graph shows very much how our commitment in Thailand was driven already six years ago, and we continuously uh, improved our efforts in Thailand um, to contribute to a clean air and to an environmental friendly um, transportation. So, what did we do so far in a glance and what are the numbers? Totally, we sold PHEVs in Thailand more than 20,000 since 2016. That's a considerable number. Um, our current plug-in hybrid models include the C-Class, the E-Class, the S-Class, the GLC, um, and the GLE. We have our uh, battery factory investment more than 100 million euros, actually, and we created 300 jobs. And we have invested in more than 150 publicly uh, accessible wall boxes in Thailand. Now, what, what we need to do and what we really need to do in order to tackle uh, climate change is we need to create a movement. We really need to work together and we need 
a concerted action uh, of the society, of the industries who invest here in Thailand, and basically of everybody. And that is what Charge to Change and this initiative I'm talking about is all about. In the end of the day, and Andreas already mentioned Glasgow, um, we have eight years left um, if we want, and if we want to still have the chance to tackle the 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, goal of global warming. But then again, this is a very theoretical number. And that is why we also think theoretical numbers need to be uh, tangible, made tangible. And clean air indirectly, obviously, contributes also to the global warming um, uh, goal. And that is why we think tackling a clean air um, makes it very tangible for people who actually live in very um, um, endangered zones. Um, and if we make their life better, ind indirectly, we also contribute a lot to the 1.5 degrees Celsius goal. So this is the reason why we think charge to change makes a lot of sense and why we are um, really keen on, uh, on doing that with everybody to, together. In 2020, um, between the 10 Thai cities, um, 15 of them were one of the most polluted in Southeast Asia. And um, the 2.5 average in Bangkok is two times higher than the WHO target. Thailand, uh, and Andreas was mentioning uh, the, the list of the most polluted countries. Thailand actually on this list uh, of the air pollution indexes is on the rank 34 of 100 and I think it was 150 um, countries there. And Bangkok uh, is on rank 35. That demonstrates that we really have uh, a cause for action and that we really need to fight uh, the air pollution. So since 2019, which, which chart is now shown on the, on the screen? This one, okay. Since 2019, we, um, we have more or less um, uh, worsened, or we, we have really worsened a lot um, our air pollution and the public um, transport and also private transport and private transit and using cars is a very um, uh, contributes very highly to the air pollution and that's more or less 50 percent of all air pollution is called uh, is caused by um, or moving your car privately or public transport or buses or trucks on the streets, but 50% of our air pollution is basically caused by, by that and the bad air quality comes from that. And that is exactly where we now need to go in and where we need to contribute. And if you connect that also to the uh, COVID crisis, actually also a study of Harvard has shown that if your respiratory system is affected by air pollution, then the likelihood of death um, is far higher in these countries than in other countries with cleaner air. So even another reason why it is very important to really contribute um, to this situation and to really um, go into tackling the issue together. What I also um, would like to mention, uh, and I go uh, into that with my next chart, is where do we stand with our charging infrastructure at the moment? And if you do this uh, comparison, because the infrastructure in the end is something which drives a lot uh, whether people are ready to go electric or plug-in hybrid or not. And when we look in our infrastructure per capita, in Thailand, 
we see that we only have 0.3 charging stations per capita, whereas countries which are known to be a very progressive have only uh, have 32 um, charging stations per capita. That's, for example, Norway. Then again, you see Mexico with only 0.2. So we are already better than some other countries, but we still have a long uh, way to go. Um, and that is exactly where we have to work together uh, with all institutions, with private investors, and with the government. And if you look at our chart and um, our map of Thailand, you see that the main investments on charging infrastructure are done in Bangkok area. That's the dark blue um, you see on that, um, on that map. And actually that's good yeah? because that is where most people in Thailand live at the moment and where most uh, cars are moved. But if we really want to get the ball rolling and if we really want to get a transformation in all transportation, and if we really want to go full electric nationwide, then obviously uh, our efforts also need to be done all around the country. And we need to uh, start constructing charging stations so that people are not afraid when they go three, four, 500 kilometers somewhere else uh, to charge their cars. So I think the basic um, start of investing in infrastructures in the Bangkok area was very good, but now we need to go the second step uh, and need to invest around Thailand and also around up country. There are basically three major challenges, um, or we identified um, three major challenges um, in order to really get a mind switch uh, in people and to really convince them that using a plug-in hybrid or going full electric makes sense. That's the charging infrastructure. I just talked about it. It's also the economic investment. How much does that vehicle cost and how much do you possibly save? And it's the consumer's mindset. So these three uh, challenges need to be tackled in order um, to convince people and in order to um, make them change their minds and jump into the direction we want them to jump uh, using plug-in hybrids and full electric vehicles. So to reach that, we need to work together. And we cannot um, do that alone. We need to really create a movement together. Um, and that is uh, also a reason why I present today in this forum, um, because what we create with Charge to Change in our opinion, is not just a campaign and it's also not just words. We really want to get as many industries, as many people, as many institutions in the boat with us um, in order to convince the society that that is the right way to do. So there are three major barriers um, we identified. Um, also um, what we need to tackle. And one of them is know-how. And we all might think, how can it be know-how? Because in the press, you read so much things about charging uh, vehicles, about electric mobility. But still, if we do, um, if we do, um, if we ask uh, customers and if we go out on the streets, if we ask people, um, on, um, on if they use their plug-in hybrids, we are sometimes very astonished that quite a high number of people who even bought a plug-in hybrid is not even charging uh, the vehicle. So what we need to promote um, together and uh, across all car manufacturers um, is why it actually makes sense to charge a plug-in hybrid if you have a plug-in hybrid and not carrying the battery around with you, always using combustion engine. Yeah? The next thing is the location of the charging stations. And that is also something um, we need to work together on. And also the government is already addressing this issue. So 
meaning we need sufficient charging stations publicly available. We need charging stations in office building. So we need to make sure that people do not have the, um, the fear that once they are running out of electric power, they don't even find a point where they can charge their vehicle. So the location and enough charging stations is another uh, issue. And then also the convenience of charging uh, needs to be addressed um, and it needs to be easy. Yeah? So for example, if charging stations are connected and if you can see on your mobile phone whether a charging station is occupied or not occupied, um, how uh, fast you possibly on this charging station uh, will be able to charge your car. Uh, all these things contribute to convenience and must be uh, addressed together. So there are three 